Well, someone said to them this morning, this is a bit of a big field to cover. And I said, well, Prime Minister doesn't get that option. You know, you have to cover what you're given. And I've been asked by Anoop and others to try and give you six or seven thoughts and ideas that might stimulate some discussion. So this is what I'm going to cover. Prevention, more care close to home, something about the workforce, seven-day service, different style of services, and working smarter. And at the end, I'm going to say something about money. Um, I've been asked, particularly by Anup, to try and be challenging and transformational. And uh, some of these solutions are going to be difficult and take time, but that's what we're here to discuss. So the first problem is the demography. We have increasing demand. By 2033, there'll be a 65% increase in the number of people over 65 and a doubling of the people over 85. Each of those people, when they come into hospital, have at least three conditions. So huge demand and also a very powerful electorate, which I'll come back to at the end. Much more powerful than my discipline, pediatrics, who have no vote. So these are likely to have a much bigger impact on government thinking than young people and crowdsourcing. Secondly, that population is getting more unhealthy, not healthier. We could face a situation for the first time in the history of Homo sapiens that longevity goes down. It's been going up year on year for 100,000 or 5 million years. It could turn the corner. We have this here is a packet of custard creams. That single packet contains 2,000 calories, and it costs 31 pence. So I, as a man in a sedentary occupation, for the princely sum of 93 pence, can buy enough calories to live from now until Sunday. That is the dilemma we're facing. We have half of the people in the UK, adults, are obese or overweight, and one third of children by the time they leave primary school are obese or overweight. So you have an expanding elderly population with comorbidities and an unhealthier population. And remember that most of the big advances in people's health have not come through healthcare. They have not come through increased spend on what we're about. They've come through education, sanitation, behavior change. The nanny state. But the nanny state is what got all those deaths from people in cars down through seat belts, drink driving limits, traffic calming. If you want to see a reduction in the five, six cyclists killed in the last nine days, I cycled here, it won't come through spending by, or things done by people like this. It will come through some environmental behavioral change. And we need to remember that medicine, doctors, nurses, make quite a small contribution to people's health and quality of life. And the current Secretary of State has these big five priorities. It's quite right. But actually, there's four common risk factors for all of them. All five share those four common risk factors. And at the Academy, we've tried to trigger a debate with uh, a call to arms, 10 points I could speak more about. But obesity is just one example of how we need to change people's behavior. Because that leads me into the fact that um, we're not going to transform the problems that you heard downstairs that we're up against by having lots more big hospitals. Fundamentally, we're going to have to treat more people, ideally in the home, and if not in the home, as close to the home as possible. Best care as possible, close to home as possible. And a lot of that will be about trying to change people's own behavior and their self-care, rather than them adopting a behavior, well, it really doesn't matter what I do, because care is free at the point of delivery, paid out of direct taxation, based on need. I've got a need. I've got coronary heart disease, I've got type 2 diabetes, and I need my hip replacing because I've been eating lots of custard creams for 50 years. That, I don't think that's sustainable. About any attendance has gone up by a million in three years, now over 20 million a year. Over 10 million of those people are admitted to hospital, but 40% of them are sent back home with nothing more than advice. Might need an x-ray. The advice might be, we've done an x-ray. I don't, I don't want to you know, make it simpler than it is. But nevertheless, they're neither admitted to hospital nor put on a drug nor have an operation. Now, that can't be an efficient use of resources, quite clearly. Hospital admissions have gone up year on year, 2003, 2013. This is HES data for England, standardized. So 2003 taken as 100%. So you can see something around a 30% increase over a decade. Yet, we have fewer hospital beds per 1,000 people than the OECD average. We have 2.4 per 1,000. 
and the OECD has 3.4 per thousand. So when your people are concerned about the fact we have waiting times in NE to get into hospital, we have waiting times for your elective surgery, and we have revolving door medicine where people get in, we've got to get them out to get the next lot in. If you were in Nicholas Henk's talk, you would find that in Germany there's vast overcapacity of hospital beds. They have more than 3.4 per thousand. So they're all competing to fill their beds because it's a business, and therefore you don't wait any time in NE, you don't wait to have your hip done, and you can stay in hospital a lot longer and not be chucked out because they have an overcapacity. And I'll come back to that when I talk about money. And those people are coming in, and a bit like the fact many go home with just advice, many come in and don't stay very long. This is my own specialty. I could show you any age group of children. But these, the red line is the number of per percentage increase in children staying one day or less in hospital. And then this is two days uh, and three days, I think. They, they've gone down a little. Huge increase in the number of children coming in, don't really need to be there, see someone like me, 40 years experience, highly paid, <laughs> highly trained, and I kind of say to the parents, well, actually, Johnny doesn't really need to be here. It's time to go home. So. And then we have huge variability within our own country. Let's not even worry about Germany or Sweden. Here's, again, from my own discipline, pediatrics. Diabetes in children isn't a product of obesity. It's almost all treated with insulin. And once diagnosed non-treatment, in theory, you should never go into coma again. If you have the right treatment, well managed, you should never go into coma. It's a completely avoidable and really the only fatal complication of diabetes in childhood. These are the 151 PCTs in England and the percentage of their children under their care percentage who are being readmitted, not dying, readmitted on treatment, readmitted with an avoidable potentially lethal complication. There's a seven-fold variation from 47% down to 7%. Within one country, one NHS, insulin's been around since 1920. It's dirt cheap. This is not going to be solved by going and looking at what they do in Sweden. It's actually being, going to be solved by bringing these people down to these people. Okay? We need a workforce that's fully trained and flexible. So we can't have Spanish practices. We can't be locked into, I only ever did the right big toe. We're going to have to be much more radical than that. And I think the public now expect the majority of their care to be delivered by fully trained doctors and nurses. So when I talk to MPs, I say, imagine you're going to EasyJet now to fly to Dublin. And I'm at the bottom of the stairs. And I say, if you go up this stair, you can fly with the fully trained pilot. Or you can go up this stair, and that plane's got a trainee pilot. Which, which one do you think the MPs would go up? Which stair do you think? What would be fine would be if you said there's a third one where there's a fully trained pilot, and alongside them is someone learning to fly that plane. But the pilot's there all the time. And we need to move to that much more supervised, proper training rather than just exposure. We absolutely need to radically and transformationally reconfigure the services. We essentially still have a 1948 model. Most of the hospitals you could look at on a map were there in 1948. And when I was president of the Royal College of Pediatrics, we did a wide-ranging review of all the services actually across the United Kingdom, not just England. And we set some standards. They weren't very demanding standards. Uh, if your child's admitted to hospital, they might want to see a consultant within 24 hours. It doesn't seem terribly unreasonable. Um, you know, some, there were 10 fairly un undemanding, unambitious standards. And we also said th the hospital's got to be fully staffed. It's kind of people exceeding the European Working Time Directive. That's a health and safety law. Breach of that's a criminal activity. When we did that and just put the calculations in, there are currently 220 24 7 children's services in the UK. You can only run 170. You've only got enough people to meet quite modest standards in the system at the moment to run 170 of them and be compliant. In fact, that's not so bad, because when you look at the figures, what, well, that means we're going to shut to 50. Half of those 220 hospitals are admitting less than seven children a day. And half of those are within a 30-minute drive of another hospital admitting less than seven children a day. So if you've got this vast, although we've only got 2.4 thousand per thousand beds compared to the OECD average across the piece, for some specialties like mine, we're trying to run a service in every place that's not doable, but we're not recognizing that that's actually incredibly inefficient because even you'll have seven children coming in, you still need a tier of people like me, and you need all the children's nurses, and you need all the speech therapists, you need all the <coughs> language translators, everything that goes, the service, whether it's seven people or 70, it's got inbuilt 
plant and people that it absolutely has to have to be safe. We need seven-day coverage. It's appalling complacency that the NHS, even in 2012, would accept that your chance, your chance, if you went into hospital today of living, would be 12% higher than if you went in on a Sunday. We've known about this for a long time. We know that it applies to my specialty, it applies to women on labor suite. Any complication you want to look at in the NHS, it's more likely at night, and it's more likely on a Saturday and Sunday, and that cannot be acceptable. And that's why Secretary of State can highlight that people coming in with diseases and illnesses, with a, a, a service that doing its best it can to make them better, potentially 3,000 of them die because of something we do. And some of that is going to be because we're not running a seven-day service and we're not running a service primarily staffed by the fully trained pilot. So finally, um, great depression. There's always great depression, like Dan says, about the money. It's all about the money. I'm actually much less despondent about the money. In fact, that survey showed most people didn't think it was the money. I went to a lecture by a professor of constitutional law when the coalition government was elected in May 2010. And he said, well, wake up. This is the style of government of almost every European country and has been since the Second World War. And actually, most of them don't last remotely as long as this government's lasted. Likely, likely that May 2015 and beyond, we'll, we'll, we'll have more a pattern of coalition government. So that's, that's not going to change. We're told we're going to have austerity till 2030. And we've got major health reforms. We've had 20 in 20 years, so we're going to have more. It's inevitable. But actually, I'm not despondent because um, I think the public are quite clever. We have a democracy. This is the number of practicing doctors per thousand in the OECD. We're not overdoctored. People are always telling us the NHS is the biggest employer after the Red Army and Indian Railways. Well, actually, there isn't an NHS. If you went to Germany, there's, there's 220 trusts. And men, this is a devolved system. If you went to Germany or Sweden or Iceland, and if they had 65 million people like we have, they'd have far more doctors than nurses. This is the same figures for nurses as doctors. It doesn't make a difference what you look at. So I don't see that we're over-doctored or over-nursed. You might say our working practices, we could be more productive. I think that's a debate we can have. Or we're overpaid, that's another debate you can have. But I don't think you can say on objective data that we've got too many. Yet we aspire to have outcomes like Sweden, like Switzerland, like Austria, like Germany. We want it on the cheap. We want to have fewer doctors and nurses, fewer beds per thousand, but have look enviously at these other countries. So the history is not only have people been getting longer since Neanderthal man. Neanderthal man onwards has been spending progressively more. There's been more money. The economy has been expanding year on year forever. And progressively, people have spent more and more on health care. This is the United Kingdom over the last decade. This is the EU. This is the US. So people choose to spend more on their health, partly reflecting new treatments and scans and proton beam therapy, partly reflecting more demand, people getting older and fatter. Back to where I started. Here's the UK spend as a percentage of GDP. It's not the highest. US, of course, that strips everybody. But again, we're comparing ourselves to Denmark, Germany, France, Holland, Austria all spend more than the UK. And then people say, oh yeah, but, but we spend direct taxation. So this is spent into public spend and private spend. We don't even spend the most public. We don't even spend actually much more than the United States. You know, the, the terrible place of greed actually spends almost as much on Medicare, Medicaid, and veterans as we do on direct taxation. So there's no real argument that we overspend. We're neither over-doctored, over-nursed, nor are we squeezing the lemon any harder than anywhere else. So, that electorate I showed you that's getting older, the 65-year-olds, 85-year-olds, might they look at this and say, well, do we really want Trident missiles? Do we really want to go to Afghanistan? Or they might say, oh, I don't know, I think these kids are all getting too much education. I think health, when you, when you were 65 and you got a vote and you got a sore hip and maybe a bit of diabetes, I think health's probably going to be the thing you're going to vote. There'll be some philanthropic people, their grandkids, they want to have free universities and get away with tuition fees and there'll be some people who say I think we should um, be the world's policeman and we should invade all these pl places and have regime change but I think actually it's potential that um, people might decide to, to elect a government that spends potentially more on health and more on prevention and finally my last slide is just to leave you with the thought that it's not all about absolute spend so you've probably read the spirit level you can take almost any measure of well-being 
happiness surveys, suicide rates, uh, survival from cancer. It almost doesn't matter what you take, educational attainment. The countries that do best aren't necessarily the wealthiest. They're the countries that are the most equitable. And if you do the same survey within the 50 states of the United States, the same applies. It's not the wealthiest states that have the longest lifespan and the healthiest people. It's the most equitable states. So this isn't a party political speech. But again, there is an option for an electorate to say, well, if we really can't, if we really don't want to jack up the percentage of GDP that we're going to spend on health, uh, maybe we should have a more equitable system. And that brings me full circle to where I started, prevention. Michael Marmot, he talks about proportionate universalism. He doesn't say just bring the, the, the deserving poor up at the bottom. He says bring the whole gradient up and you get huge benefits for society. So I've shown you two, two examples where we don't need to look at other countries, really. I show you the example of diabetic ketoacidosis, a potentially fatal complication. We just, within our own country, need to bring the best up to the worst. And then if you look at prevention, societal measures, again, we don't really need to have an economy that's as big as the US. We could start by just having a more equitable economy where when you go along the central line, there's not a 13-year difference in longevity between east and west ends of the central line. Thank you very much. <laughs>